I'm Logan Crawford, and right now on Spotlight, we're delighted to welcome back one of my favorite guests. Her name is Estelle Everingham, and she has written a remarkable book about a remarkable young man. The name of the book is One of the King's Men. This heartfelt and factual account shares the remarkable life of her son, Cameron, who demonstrated an extraordinary connection with God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the spiritual realm. Cameron, a tall, blonde athlete known for his kindness and his remarkable ability to connect with the divine. He grew up in Australia during the 1980s and 90s, and his life was a typical blend of childhood adventures, but not typical at all. He had profound spiritual experiences as well. We're delighted to have this talented author join us back here on Spotlight. Once again, we thank the team at Prime 7 Media for helping us put her in the spotlight today. And we ask viewers like you to support writers like her by subscribing to this channel and by purchasing this wonderful book. The links are below this interview. Estelle, great to see you here today on Spotlight. Wonderful to be here too, Logan. It's just a thrill to be able to talk to you again about my son, Cameron, and the amazing life that he lived. He did have an amazing life. And every time we talk about him and your book, it is very, very faith affirming. So I'm looking forward to talking to you today about it. Let's start at the beginning. Cameron, right from the start, uh, showed remarkable connection with uh, the spiritual world and with, and with God. Tell us about that. Well, when Cameron was being born, I was informed that there had been no heartbeat or no pulse for 13 hours, and this baby was obviously dead. The doctors had no choice but to try and save my life because they said there's no use trying to save his, he's gone. So I said to my husband, oh, goodness, they're wanting to take him out, cut him up and take him out piece by piece. I didn't know they even would do such a thing. Would you please go and phone the men at church who will be having their once a month prayer breakfast right now? So off he went and he phoned them. And the next thing, Cameron was born, much to the surprise of the doctor who was not even facing me. He was getting the, the nurses to Velcro up his gown because he had all those horrible instruments out ready to cut this baby up. And Cameron was suddenly born. He nearly landed on the floor because nobody was ready to catch a baby who was obviously dead. Well, they took him away because he had the cord around his neck three times and he wasn't breathing. And they brought him back after a little while and said to me, you have a 10 pound, two and a half ounce baby boy and he seems to be all right. So he was born right into the prayers of those men. And, <coughs> excuse me, Cameron's first sentence at 11 months old was God's not dead. And he lived his whole 14 year life proving it. Amazing, amazing. God's not dead. That is such a profound <laughs> statement to come from a young person, uh, a child 14 months old. Uh, you must have been absolutely shocked <laughs> to heard those words come out of his mouth, right? We were, yes, it was his first sentence. Yeah. Very shocking. Yes. Amazing. Amazing. And as his young life continued, in many ways, he was just like any other little boy, but he kept on astonishing you with his connection to God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, when Cameron was three years old, he came out of his bedroom and he said to me, Mum, why do they do the pictures of Jesus with the nail prints there and there on his hands when they're really there and there on his wrists? And I said to him, are they, Cameron? How do you know? And he said, when Jesus was in my room last night and he held out his hands and he smiled at me, I saw them. They are there and there. Just what do you do with that child? Amazing. Amazing. So he was having visions at such a young age, meeting <laughs> Jesus. Um, his connection was very, very strong. I mean, at an age when most kids haven't even been introduced to the concept of religion, he seemed to understand Jesus quite well. Oh, he did. Yes, he told us all sorts of things, which he got from his friend Sonia, who I thought was a girl, but I found out, no, Sonia's his guardian angel. And he could see Sonia and talk to Sonia all the time, which he did. 
Yep. Amazing. Amazing. And as he grew, uh, he started doing, uh, he went to school and uh, you, he also has an older brother, correct? Yes. Yeah. Toddy. Yeah. Yep. Toddy. And uh, tell us a little bit about his years in school, Cameron. Cameron was an athlete and his athletic ability came out during his school years, right from the time he was in grade one and he was five years old. He, he put himself in a, a cross-country event that was actually meant for the much older children. Mm -hmm. The others were all 11 and 12 years old and here's this five-year-old in there. And he just ran and ran and ran. He hadn't made any preparation for this. He didn't have his his joggers on or anything. He just had his ordinary school shoes. And he was beaten by 11 uh, 12-year-olds. But he beat all the 11-year-olds, all the 10-year-olds, and in he came rushing in. And I was looking at his leg muscles and I thought, boy, oh, boy, he's got some really, really flash leg muscles there. Well... He, as he grew older, he um, he trained at Little Athletics at Springwood and he did very, very well. He became um, one of the state champions in 100 metres, 200 metres, mm. 400, 800, 1500, 3K, 5K, 8K, and he was the cross-country champion. As well as that, he was a cycling champion and he also did a bit of karate so he was a very athletic boy and he re he was really proud of his leg muscles let me tell you yeah. Yeah, he would say to me mum the leg muscles are important <laughs> so i tried not to forget that the leg muscles were important he wasn't yeah. going to let me forget but he just really enjoyed being involved in athletics and it was his you know apart from his walk with god which was remarkable beyond description mm -hmm. his athletic ability was something that we were really proud of because it was like he found a niche because he, he was not very um, academically successful which I put right. down to the fact that for for so long after his birth he didn't have sufficient supplies of oxygen mm -hmm. to his brain right. so you know he his maths particularly was something that wasn't even on the same planet with Cameron no. Right. But apart from that, you know, he, he was fine. Yeah. Well, yeah. my math wasn't great either. So uh, we have that in common. You know, oh, a lot well, of young lovely. men aren't great at math. That's for sure. Um, what was it like writing this book? It must have been a, a wonderful journey to contemplate and think about and remember the time you had with Cameron. Yes, it was. It took me nine months to get the first sentence but I knew that once I got the first sentence, I could just sit down and it would all pour out of me. So yeah. nine months to get the first sentence and five weeks to write the whole book longhand because I didn't trust my limited computer skills. Right. I thought I'll get halfway through the book and I'll lose the whole lot. So yeah. I wrote it out on a grade four exercise book. and mm -hmm. uh, Well, I wrote it in five grade four exercise books and it was really, it was really sort of, I don't know, it's kind of overwhelming, but very, very refreshing too yeah. to go through Cameron's life just bit by bit by bit and put it all together and, you know, then read through it and think, wow, I've never heard anything like that from about any other child or from any other parent. So, yeah. yes, I mean, and I also made sure that I um, uh, allowed space to let Toddy know that I didn't blame him or hold anything against him whatsoever, mm. he having been the one who was driving when the accident occurred that took Cameron's life. Yeah. So, yeah, I knew Toddy would read the book, which he did, mm. and his uh, his words to me were, that was a side, of, a side of my brother that I didn't even know existed, which is another reason that I wrote the book, because I thought once I'm gone, nobody will really know that the Cameron that I knew right. and spent time with every day. Yes. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. I'm sure it was mixed emotions writing the book at time. It was yeah. probably very, very hard, you know, to relive these moments because you do miss him, even though, you know, he's in a better place. Um, it's yes. still hard. It's still hard. Now it said, you said it took nine months to write the first sentence. Do you remember what the first sentence wound up being? 
well, I don't remember it word for word, but it was about his birth and about the fact that the doctors had said to me that they were going to have to cut this baby up and take him out piece by piece. And I didn't know that they would say that to anybody. Never mind, he was somebody standing there saying this to me. And, right. yeah, that was just quite a shocking a yeah. shocking thing to hear from anybody. Absolutely, yes. absolutely. It's a, a, a horrible way to start a life. But like you said, you yes. witnessed uh, a miracle early on when the prayers that were said yes. by the community and by you were answered that Cameron survived. I know it was very, very important for Cameron to be baptized. Tell me about this yes. story. You, you guys were on holiday when it happened, I believe, right? Yes. Yes, we were, on a, we were having just a little mini break, three nights and four days up at the Sunshine Coast at a resort up there. And we got to day three which was the Sunday, and Cameron suddenly said to me when he was in the spa with me, Mum, I've got to, we've got to go home. And I said, well, yes, we're going home tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And he said, no, no, we've got to go home now, right now. And I said, well, what's so important about going home right now? And he said, well, Mum, they're having baptisms at church tonight, and I haven't been baptised in water, so I... I want to go home and get baptised. And I said, well, you know that our pastor has baptisms about every six weeks. Mm -hmm. There are people being baptised. When we get home, you can talk to him and see if you can be baptised in the next lot of baptisms. And he said, oh, no, Mum, I've got to be baptised today. And it was like, he, it was almost like he knew that he didn't have, never mind six weeks, he didn't have one more Sunday. This yeah. was his last Sunday on earth. So I said to him, well, it, was, it wasn't like Cameron to argue with me at all either. He just, if I said no, that was it, he took that. But he was so keen to be baptised. I thought there's got to be something underlying this. And I said, well, if you really want to be baptised today, how about you go and get your father who was lying down in the unit with a migraine of all things. Mm. How about you go and get him and tell him that you want to be baptised and see if he will come out and baptise you. And my thought was that Cameron would know better than to go and interrupt his father when he's lying down with a migraine. Mm. That's just never going to be a popular thing to do. But away he went. I thought, well, he must be very keen and the next thing out, they both came in their board shorts and carrying towels. And mm. my husband said to me, I'm going to baptise Cameron in the third swimming pool of this resort because I don't think there'll be anybody there at that pool. So if you'd like to come to witness that, come along. So I'm quickly out of the spa and away we went. And Cameron was baptised in wow. the third swimming pool of that resort on what was his last Sunday afternoon on earth. And Amazing. he was just so thrilled to be baptised. And I think it was also quite a thrill for my husband to have the opportunity to be the one who baptised him on that day. Yes, yeah, yeah. so that was Cameron's baptism. Amazing. And, yes. you know, it's easy as a parent. You're tired. Your husband has a headache, a bad headache, a migraine. Yes. Say, no, Cameron, we're not doing it. We're staying here. We're going home tomorrow. We'll do it another time. Now just go to your room. You know, but you didn't do that. You listened to him. You, your husband got out of the bed off the couch, even though he wasn't feeling well and did what Cameron wanted. And it turned out to be one of his last few days on earth. So that is a, a wonderful memory that you have with him, that he had this great connection yes. with you, your husband and with God at that point as well. Yes. Yeah. Yes, wonderful. and Cameron was just so pleased to have been able to be baptised because, you know, really he had just less than one week to live after mm. that happened because when he was in the spa with me, he had also said to me, Mum, I haven't got very long to live. And he went through his life and forgave people for things they'd done to him and planned how he wanted his funeral. Well, from the time he said that sentence... Um, he had exactly one week left to live to the minute. Amazing. And then he was baptised after having said that when he made his little speech about needing to go home. So he had probably half an hour less than a week to live when he was being baptised in the pool. 
Yeah. Tell, tell, tell the viewers at home a little bit about these conversations he had with Cameron when he kept on telling you he was going to go home um, and what you made of it and how that transpired. Tell me about that. Well, from the time he was about two years old, he would talk not just about heaven, but going home to heaven. And he mm. always talked about wanting to go home to heaven. He talked about Jesus coming back in the clouds for us and about the fact that we shouldn't be talking about that because it says in the Bible that when you're not expecting him is when he'll come. And he mm. said to me one day, let's talk about Jesus coming back. And I said, okay, what do you want to tell me? He was two years old and he's telling me all about Jesus coming back for us. Then he said, mum, we've got to stop talking like this. And I thought, I'm thinking, well, it was your idea. Mm -hmm. And I said, why is that? And he said, because the Bible says he comes back when you're not expecting him and he could be standing up ready to come and he looks down and he sees we're expecting him. He said, <coughs> if Cameron, if Jesus is standing up and sitting down and standing up and sitting down in heaven, it's all our fault, Mum, so we've got to stop talking like this. Mm -hmm. That was just Cameron. That's how he worked. Yeah. That's what he thought. Amazing. Amazing. Yes. And then a week later, <laughs> um, a tragic thing happened. There was a car accident in the neighborhood. Tell us a little bit about that. Well, we saw um, Toddy and his friend David driving out in, in David's car. They went past our place and we were we, we knew that he, they were going to pick up Toddy's car from his sister's place because his car needed to be towed home to be fixed so that he could drive it to work the next day. But we didn't know whether Toddy was driving or David was driving. Anyway, we were sitting having our lunch and Cameron was out jogging. And I said to my husband, um, no, rather, he said to me, can you hear the sirens and the it's, he said, I can hear a fire engine, I can hear a police siren, and I can hear an ambulance. And, he's, and I looked out the window and I said, you can hear a fire engine? Well, it's raining a bit. It's not going to be a bushfire. And he said, no, with all those sirens, it'll be a car accident. Mm -hmm. And the boys had only just driven out, well, maybe 30 seconds before. And he said, it sounds like it's just down the end of our road and the boys can only have got that far. He said, I'll, I'll just drive down and make sure that it's not something that the boys are involved in. Mm. So off he went and I'm waiting there because he said he'd ring me up and let me know if it was them. And the phone rang and he said, yes, there's been an accident and it's uh, David's car. And he said, the ambulance men are working on Toddy by the side of the road. And he said also that David is trapped in the vehicle. And he said, I'm going to go and have a look and make sure that David's all right because the firemen are using the jaws of life to try and re remove the roof so that David can be able to be rescued out of the car. He said, I'll be home in a few minutes, write a little note for Cameron and let him know that we'll have to go to the hospital because Toddy is injured. He seems to be, you know, not too terribly badly injured, but we'll need to go to the hospital. So leave Cameron a note. When he comes back from jogging, his lunch is on the table. He can have that and he'll know where we've gone. So I'm, I'm waiting for him to come back. I didn't write Cameron a note. I just didn't feel to do that, so I didn't. But I got myself ready to leave as soon as he would come back. And when he did come back, his face was all grey and pinched looking and he looked just awful. And I said to him, what's the matter? Because I'm thinking, well, maybe maybe Toddy's lost a leg or something. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, of all things, he said, and Cameron's dead. Cameron's dead. Cameron's dead. I said, what do you mean Cameron's dead? Cameron can't be dead. Cameron's jogging. And then he told me that, when he was going towards the car to see how uh, David was, he said he heard young people in the crowd that had gathered to have a look at the accident scene saying something about the blonde boy dead on the back seat. And he said, well, I can't think what blonde boy would be in the car. The only blonde boy that we know is Cameron and he's jogging. So he said he, he, he went close enough to see how David was and 
he saw that Cameron was in the back seat of the car, still in his seat belt, and he was just lying on the back seat dead. And he said, I, um, I went to open the door to see what I could do. He said, there was nothing, nothing I could do, but I went to open the door anyway. And he said, the wave of peace that came shooting out of the door there, and he said, it would have knocked me to the ground. I would have been flat on my back on the ground if I wasn't hanging on to the, the handle of the, the car door. And he said, he heard a voice from above his right shoulder say to him, it's all right, Dad. I'm okay. I'm fine. Nobody can hurt me now. I'm perfectly all right. And he said, well, oh, I just didn't know what to do. But he said it was the most amazing thing. And we found out later that uh, David had been in a terrible way because the roof of the car had embedded itself in the top of his head mm. and he had actually died but been able to be revived three times that night. But as as far as we know, he's because he, he then moved to live back out with his parents way back out west in Queensland and we've heard, you know, that he's, well, he's not all right, but he's still alive, but he's mm. incapable of doing anything. He will never work or do anything very much in his life ever again. But, you know, it was just an accident that happened. Mm. Nobody was at fault particularly. Right. You know, Toddy wasn't found to have been drinking or speeding or doing anything. It was just that the t one of the tyres of the car had blown out and... Uh, when they were going down the road, just in the road that we lived, uh, they saw Cameron jogging and David had wound down his window and called out to him, hey, Cameron, we're going to tow Toddy's car home. We could use your muscles. And, of course, mm. Cameron, being always helpful and willing to assist, said, righto, and he went and jumped in the back seat of the car and I think he probably only would have gone about 100 metres till they got to the corner of the road and when they went around the corner of the tyre, the one under which he was sitting, because he was the back seat passenger, that tyre just blew out and, you know, the car was sort of all over the road and an accident occurred, so it wasn't Toddy's fault. Yeah. But Cameron went home to heaven, so he got his... He, he got mm -hmm. what he'd been wanting for since, you know, virtually since he was born. He got to go home to heaven right. on that day. Right. Yes. Heaven gained another angel that day. You lost an angel on earth. And I know that's difficult to deal with, no matter how strong your faith is. But uh, you yeah. have seemed to come to peace with it. And afterwards, did you have any did you have any spiritual realization? Or tell me about how you reacted to this, because it's obviously a mother's worst fear for something like this to happen. Tell me about how it impacted you and... I thought you had a moment of revelation also with um, with uh, God. Yes, well, it was sort of after Cameron had gone, there were a couple of things that I wanted to do to clear up. One was Cameron had a cubby house up. At, you had to go up the stair, up the a ladder to get to this cubby house. It was mm -hmm. on the mezzanine floor of our carports. And he used to go up in this cubby house and take other kids from school up there and pray for them and do all sorts of things mm. like that. So I thought, well, I better go up the ladder and just check and make sure none of Cameron's belongings are still sitting up in the cubby house. Well, when I got to the top of the ladder, here was this great big sign written in really dark felt pen right across the front of the cubby, and it said, this cubby is protected by the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ forever and ever. Amen. So I thought, well, that's interesting. <laughs> <laughs> there wasn't anything in there that I needed to rescue, but it was very nice to have a, a confrontation with that sign. Right. I then decided that I would check out the meaning of Sonia because Sonia was Cameron's guardian angel who always seemed to give him such wise advice and tell him all sorts of things that Cameron would come out with that he could never learn from anybody else. So I looked up the meaning of Sonia in a baby's name book and I found that Sonia meant wisdom of mm. all things and I thought that'd be right. That kid was tapping into heaven's wisdom 
from the day he was born, probably beforehand too. And I actually had a conversation with Sonia, which seems strange, but I did. I uh, encountered Sonia at church one night and I had a conversation with Sonia in which Sonia said to me um, that Cameron gets to leave heaven and come to earth on assignment because when he died, he arrived in heaven with virtually his whole soul realm intact. Wow. Now, you know, when, when you get born again and you, you give your life to Jesus, that's your spirit that gets saved. And it's up to you to, you know, look after what's going on in your soul realm. Well, Cameron's was pretty much perfect. And they mm -hmm. said he gets to leave and come and do, do things on earth, do things on assignment because of the depth of his soul realm and the fact that it's pretty much all intact. And he thanked me for the way he had that I had brought Cameron up, which I thought was amazing. He had been thanked for something by an angel. Yeah. It's pretty astonishing yeah. and very humbling also. And he also said that before Cameron was born and he had already been assigned to be Cameron's guardian angel, he said, we thought about not sending him to you at all because the number of his days was so short. But then we thought, no, even though the number of his days is short and I will only have him for a short time, the benefit of having Cameron for that time would far outweigh the horror of the loss of him on earth. Mm -hmm. And the fact that he could come back on assignment would also be something that would be very special, which it has proved to be. Yeah, because his father is still in um, a lot of physical trouble you know he's got mm. problems with his heart his kidneys his lungs all sorts of things mm. and uh, when he had the migraine that, that's because he'd had a hundred spinal operations wow. and each level of his back had collapsed on the one underneath and when it got right up close to the top up near his neck he started getting migraines really bad ones very frequently so you know sometimes he's in bed just wishing he could die and he said mm. he would say to me there was somebody here in, in my room. He said, did you let the dogs in? Did they jump up? And I said, no, 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 they're out in the yard. And he said, well, somebody was in my bed. I could feel the bed moving and I could feel movement on the end of the bed. He said, what should I do? And I said to him, well, maybe you could say, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. Yeah. And he said, well, I tried that, but that didn't work. He said, I think next time that happens, I'll say, hello, Cam. Yeah. And he said, so now he just says, hi, hi to Cameron. <laughs> you know, and he said, I can feel his presence in the room. And he said, I know he's here. And he said, maybe he's, he said, sometimes I think he's here to take me home. And I said, well, I think maybe he's here to prepare you to go home. So, you know, Cameron, Cameron comes and goes. Yeah. I, I thought that once he went to heaven, he would at least have the decency to stay where you knew where he was. <laughs> no. Oh, no, 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 no. Cameron was always different. That's so, funny. yeah. That's funny. Yes. Well, Cameron had Sonia who looked after him, and now you have Cameron yes. who looks after you, your own angel, I'm sure. Yes. And yes. I hope he brings you great blessings this Christmas season. I hope you're better with your uh, sickness. And I hope your husband is feeling much, much better as well. And I yes. uh, really appreciate you sharing the story of Cameron with us. I think it's faith affirming. I think it's so important for the folks at home to hear. As you know, I've memorized his story at this point from reading his book and from, uh, from speaking with you. So uh, there's two of us now and, and more who know the story of Cameron because of your great work. So we thank you for that. The name of the book for folks at home, it's called One of the King's Men. It's written by Estelle Everingham. It's a heartfelt factual account that shares the, real, shares the uh, account of a remarkable life, her son, Cameron, who was taken much, much too soon. Uh, it's interesting when John F. Kennedy died, his brother Ted said he had every gift except for length of years. Well, that's the same as true of Cameron. He had every gift, but length of years. But the short time he was here on earth, he touched a lot of lives. And now because of the work of his mother through this wonderful book, we are touching more lives than ever before. Thank you so much for joining me today. 
I'm Logan Crawford, thanking you for your time this time. Until next time on Spotlight.